Another aspect of Jewish folklore is the multilingual nature of it, which is a byproduct of the diaspora. The language of scripture is Lashon Kodesh, the holy language, Hebrew and Aramaic. But Jews also spoke the Jewish language of their community, Yiddish, Ladino, or Judeo-Arabic and others. And on top of that, the Jews spoke the languages of the co-territorial peoples, their non-Jewish neighbors. My mother was from Bukovina, Romania, so Yiddish was spoken at home, German in the street, Romanian in school, and Ukrainian to the non-Jews. Her folklore included half Ukrainian, half Yiddish proverbs and expressions, such as Shotam Titzuch, what's going on? Or a children's rhyme that begins with a line from a morning Hebrew prayer, but quickly becomes a Yiddish parody of that prayer. Moidani, Shtetov in Defri, Kricharain in Blote, Biz Sudekni. I thank you when I awake in the morning, then I crawl into the mud up to my knee. The multilingual nature of Jewish society easily allowed the influx of non-Jewish folklore, which, however, usually had to be adapted in some way to be made acceptable to a Jewish audience. Another aspect of Jewish folklore is the importance of written texts and their interplay with orally transmitted texts. As mentioned before, the oral transmission of folk culture, folk traditions, from person to person, from generation to generation, had always been one of the central tenets of folklore. But since education is so highly esteemed in the Jewish world, the literacy rate has been high and at least some familiarity with the classic written Jewish texts among men was widespread. This interaction between oral and written could last hundreds of years. For example, suppose a writer in the 17th century collects the Hebrew and Yiddish folk tales that he has heard orally and prints them in a volume. The stories are thus printed, and one could say frozen forever in that form, but no, Jews then read the stories and told them. And in the telling, in the performing of them, the storyteller adds details, adds a scene that he heard somewhere else, adds a small boy in the story because he's telling it to a small boy. A hundred years later, that printed story has circulated into several dozens of oral versions, and someone comes along and collects them into another volume, and the process begins again. Returning to a point made earlier about the performance of folklore, the oral nature of performance of folklore changes the text. The context of how that folklore is transmitted becomes important. I once asked my father to tell me the story of Purim as an experiment in orality, in storytelling. He was born in a small town in Romania and was a medical doctor who received his MD diploma in Bologna, Italy in 1939. But he grew up studying Talmud and had a solid Jewish education, so he knew the story of the Megillah very well. But the version he told me had juicy details with erotica and vulgarity and motifs that are to be found in the Midrashim and legends told about Esther and Purim that never made it into the printed Megillah. So just because a tale is printed does not mean it will not change when it is told, performed. It is also true that for Jews, the written texts are so central to their folklore that even the Aleph Bays, the letters themselves, are part of Jewish mythology. The Yiddish classic work, the Tzenerena, was a bestseller since its publication at the turn of the 17th century. It was written for women and is arranged according to the portion of the Bible that is read each week. The very first legend is an explanation, a legend of why the first word in the Bible, Bereshis, in the beginning, begins with the second letter of the Aleph Bez, Bez, and not the first, Aleph. The text explains that because the Hebrew word for blessing, Brocha, begins with Bez, while the Hebrew word for curse, Arura, begins with an Aleph, that the second letter was given that honor. But when the letter Aleph complained to God, God assured the letter Aleph that the Torah would start with his letter. And the Ten Commandments do indeed begin with an Aleph, Anoichi. Another commentary in the Tzenerana says that since the letter Bez has three sides closed and one side open, it reflects the created world with the open side being heaven. Therefore, it is the more appropriate letter to start the world. So you see that the very creation of the world is tied to the Jewish alphabet in Jewish folklore. This could only happen in a society, a culture, intimately tied to learning, to reading. The Tzenaren is called the Teitschomish, the Yiddish version of the Bible, but it is hardly a translation. Rather, it reflects the oral, storytelling nature of the Yiddish readership, which was largely comprised of women.